Good evening and welcome to Point Blank here at KTN News. And we are shooting from the Nairobi Serena. Nairobi County, Nairobi City was written long ago by Barbara Woods and she described it as the green city in the sun. Our metropolis, our capital, Nairobi County, has been at the center of everything Kenyan since our independence in 1963. Nairobi traces its roots and heritage to the construction of the Uganda Railway, which began operating in 1899. The railway depot centrally located between Mombasa and Kampala, Uganda, would in 1900 be incorporated as a township. And in 1905, the British East Africa Protectorate moved its capital from Mombasa to Nairobi, the place of cold waters. With British settlers, Indian workmen and African laborers drawn to it, the township rapidly expanded. In 1907, the colonial government constructed Government House on a 740-acre piece of land to serve as the official residence of the governor of British East Africa. The township was transformed to the Nairobi Municipal Council in 1919 and its boundary extended to include semi-urban settlements. In 1923, the title of mayor was adopted by the chief administrator of the municipality. In 1950, with Nairobi marking its 50th year of official existence, the municipal council sought to change its status to that of a city. A royal charter of incorporation for the same was duly granted by the king in March of that year. Sixteen years later and upon independence, Nairobi became the capital of the Republic and Charles Rubia, her first elected African indigenous mayor in 1964. Nairobi, which serves as the political and financial capital of Kenya and is home to over 100 major international organizations, including the United Nations office, the only city to be recognized south of the hemisphere with a 21.7% GDP contribution, according to the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics Gross County Product 2019, and a population of over 4.5 million is in severe political, fiscal, and humanitarian crisis today. Recently, the Building Bridges Initiative radically proposed that Nairobi be accorded a spacious status, presumably scrapping its current county status. Worldwide, the only comparable example of the spacious status is the United States of America's capital, Washington, D.C. Unique among other African cities, Washington was established by the Constitution of the United States specifically to serve as the newly founded nation's capital and seat of government. The founders, too, envisioned Washington as the commercial center, and its location was partly informed by this. Indeed, the United States Congress exercised exclusive jurisdiction over the city. It was not until 1973 that the district got an elected 13-member local government council. Can Kenya adapt this centuries-old example and change the city and county's fortunes for the better? Following the enactment of the 2010 Constitution, Nairobi County had its first election where Governor Evans Kidero was elected. In the fourth following election, Governor Mike Buvisonko was elected. To many who live in the city and to many who voted in these county elections, Nairobi just seems to be a never-ending drama and a never-ending push and pull. The instruments of promulgation of the new constitution the promulgation of the 2010 Constitution of Kenya on 27th August 2010 was a tipping point in the nation's history, ostensibly reconfiguring the balance of power that had been vested in the central government to 47 distinct county governments. On 4th March 2013, Evans Kidero, the Orange Democratic Movement Party candidate, would have the honor of being elected as Nairobi County's first governor. He promised to uplift the county's economy and her people's living conditions. Kidero's term was not without controversy. His first major hurdle was the nullification of his win on the grounds of electoral malpractices by the Court of Appeal a year later. However, a five-judge Supreme Court bench upheld his victory on 29th August 2014. Much was expected of the suave businessman and his team. However, frequent clashes between the governor and other elected Nairobi representatives tampered his tenure. 
his much-fancied green grass projects that coincided with the 2015 visit of U.S. President Barack Obama wilted, as did the rest of his city's beautification program. Nairobians had had enough, and Kidero failed to get re-elected during the August 2017 general election. Kidero worried and continues to spend the ensuing years out of office under the radar of the DCI and DPP. He's a frequent visitor to Integrity Center, the courts and cells. Kidero has been charged with multiple counts of defrauding the county of Nairobi and his reputation is in ruins. In Kidero state, Nairobians voted overwhelmingly for the Jubilee Party candidate Mike Buvi Sonko. <laughs> All eyes were on the self-styled Robin Hood, from the confirmation of his election and subsequent swearing-in. What type of leadership would he offer the capital? Six months in office, his deputy governor, Polly Kapigade, would announce his resignation on Twitter. Igade cited frustrations and failure to earn his governor's trust to enable him drive the administration and management of the county. Two years and two months counting, Nairobi has been without a deputy governor. In September 2019, Sonko announced on his Facebook page that he had chosen to stay away from his main office following accusations of corruption regarding the award of a garbage collection contract. Three months later, the governor was dramatically arrested at Voi on 6th December 2019 after the director of public prosecutions, Nurdin Haji, ordered for the same over the loss of 357 million shillings of county funds. It was alleged that the governor was attempting to flee the country. With no deputy governor in place, despite Sonko's last-minute attempt to nominate Anne Kanano Mwenda to the position on 6th January 2020 and a series of comical cabinet reshuffles, the county and Kenya's capital city has been rendered rudderless. Who will save Nairobi from one man's egoistic actions? How can the nation ensure that this state of affairs at the heartbeat of the republic shall never occur again? In an exclusive interview on Point Blank on 23rd October 2019, Governor Mike Movisonko categorically revealed that among the payments he had authorized was that of Amaco Insurance, a firm associated with the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. Did you pay Amaco? Yes, I paid Amaco. And I want to come to that. Yeah, I want to come to that. Because there's a letter that was uh, done by the ESCC now. This is where my problem started. I don't want to Did you pay or you didn't I, pay I Amaco? I paid Amaco, a company which is associated with the deputy president. I paid it. So you should give me time so that I flow pole pole for Kenyans. You have raised a very grievous, sensitive question. You have raised a grievous allegation against the deputy president, who is not a director of Amaco. And I'm not trying to defend him, but the company is associated with him. I'm coming to that. On 13th February 2020, former Cabinet Secretary for Sports and Culture Rashid Echessa was arrested by Directorate of Criminal Investigations Detectives and charged with forgery in a case involving an alleged 39 billion shillings fraudulent arms deal. What is particularly noteworthy about his latest scandal is his stunning links to Harambe Annex, which hosts the official offices of the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. Be it shady county dealings, non-existent dumps, maize and sugar messes, and now an out-of-this-world arms deal, the name William Samoe Ruto and his close associates feature. A closer look reveals tangent similarities between the political and financial trajectories of Ruto and Kenya's longest-serving vice president, the late Professor George Saitoti. The relatively unknown mathematician joined politics as a nominated MP in 1983 and was immediately elevated to lead the Ministry of Finance. Saitoti was the vice president and minister for finance when the Goldenberg scandal came to light. This outright theft is estimated to have cost Kenya approximately 10% of our annual GDP. Over the years, Saitoti would be referred to as Mr. Fixit, and stories swirled concerning his unaccountable and unexplained wealth. Even now, eight years after his tragic demise, those questions linger, as do those on Deputy Ruto's deep coffers. It certainly begs the question, does the office of the Deputy President lead to instant treasurers? A KTN looked far and wide to look for somebody to come and decipher Mambo Nairobi to tell us what's going on behind the scenes. Has Nairobi run before better? Is Nairobi running properly now? Can Nairobi actually function without a governor and a deputy? 
we have brought the only sitting deputy governor of Nairobi who finished her term, <laughs> Jonathan Mweke, to tell us what's going on behind the scenes. But before I talk to my brother, what has he done before? Jonathan Mweke was born and bred in Nairobi County, Kenya. Jonathan attended Wayne State University in the United States of America, where he earned a major in Bachelor of Science Computer Science and a minor in Business Administration. During his undergraduate years, he served as the organizing secretary for the African Students Association. Jonathan would proceed to the Auckland University and Ghana an MBA double major in Global Information Technology and Entrepreneurship. At Wayne State University, Jonathan worked as a system administrator for Kmart, one of the largest retailers in the country, and at Dalmas Chrysler Corporation as a technology project manager, among other employment in the U.S. In 2006, after relocating back to Kenya, Jonathan acquired shares and joined the board of eManage Africa, a records and document management company. After running and growing eManage Africa to be the largest locally owned records management company in the country, second in market share, Jonathan and his core shareholders sold the company in 2018 to a global French entity. In 2011, Jonathan acquired shares and joined the board of Spartan Developers, now TSG Realty. TSG Realty, together with its sister company, TSG Hospitality, have grown to be premier real estate companies in the East African region. To date, the firm has successfully completed four real estate projects with a further three projects under construction, as well as two projects fully designed and awaiting local government approval to commence construction. In 2013, Jonathan was elected the first deputy governor of Nairobi County, the capital city of Kenya. For the nearly five years in office, Jonathan oversaw the trade, infrastructure, agriculture, youth and our city sectors in the country. As deputy governor, Jonathan was able to develop and implement several policies that so directly contributed to Nairobi's ranking as the top foreign direct investment FDI destination in Africa. A true believer in giving back to the community and mentoring young people in the business community, Jonathan has championed the Feature Uchi Initiative, which seeks to provide dignity to young children from poverty-stricken families by providing them with school uniform. This initiative has seen hundreds of children clothed within the public school system. The avid reader, gopher, and professional disc jockey's leadership potential has been identified in both professional and political spheres. He has earned honors both locally and abroad, including being an elected member of Strathmore, who's who in leadership in the USA. Jonathan was also the founding president of the Kenya Community Abroad Michigan chapter and belongs to Sunward's exclusive leadership and usual FFWD fraternity. Jonathan is married to Shiko and together have two children. Good evening, you're watching Point Blank here at KTN News. Governor, General the Karibu Sana at KTN Santa Sana. Santa Sana. Look, I am happy to see you. Yes. I want to start at the beginning. Uh, you are the first elected deputy governor uh, of the county of Nairobi. That's correct. So you have an inside view yes. of, of the county. First of all, for Kenyans who don't know, how big is the county of Nairobi financially, in terms of scope of work, in terms of the services, if you were to give us a bird's eye view of the county? Yeah, Nairobi uh, in size, first of all, is about 696 uh, square kilometers. So it's not a very big county in terms of, of size. Uh, you know, Nairobi was formed in 1900 when the railway was coming, uh, passing through from Mombasa going to Kisumu. Uh, the capital city, Tony, then was Machakos. Uh, and then they had a stop in Nairobi. <laughs> 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 yes, it used to be Machakos. <laughs> yes, what <laughs> was So uh, it was moving uh, on the railway was moving, and they stopped in Nairobi. 
which they called it the city of cool waters. That's what Nairobi actually means. It's a Maasai name that means the city of cool waters because it was a swamp. And when they stopped here, they built uh, bases for the railway workers. And because they needed services, shops came up. And Nairobi became the capital, capital city. Uh, today, it is still the capital city. It hosts the national government, both houses of parliament, the Senate and the National Assembly. It hosts all diplomatic missions. It hosts the presidency. It hosts uh, the United Nations. You know, Nairobi is uh, the only UN full station uh, in a developing world. Because we have New York, we have Vienna, we have Geneva, and then we have Nairobi. And of course, it hosts the judiciary. So we are the heart of this country. Right. In terms of uh, PESA, yes. in terms of GDP, yes. uh, PESA, people say 60% of um, Kenya's economy is here. But in, in, within the county, how much money is within the budget, whether it is raised or not? What kind of money are we looking at? Well, uh, by the time we were leaving office, our budget was about 36 billion. Uh, right now, I understand it's about 32, 32 billion. Uh, Nairobi, last census, 4.3 million people, which means it's almost uh, headed to 10% of uh, national population. So let's get behind the scenes. Yes. Let's get into your, your office yes. and your boardroom, yes. Mukaingia. What were the challenges you first saw? What did you and Governor Kidero try to address uh, in your first term? What were the giant issues? People talk about garbage collection, uh, people talk about parking, people talk about drainage, etc. What are the, um, uh, the, 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 the real important matters that you found on your entry? Uh, well, first of all, we didn't find very good systems because Nairobi was run uh, through mayors and town clerks since independence. Uh, then you had a small break around the 90s when all of that Nairobi was disbanded and former President Moy appointed a commission which was uh, chaired by Fred Gumo. Uh, before that in the 70s also a commission had been formed with the late uh, Gala Mwendwa also as a chairman of the commission. Those are the only two times really Nairobi's governance was interrupted. Then came devolution. So Governor Kidero and myself were the pioneers of devolution is the first governor, the first deputy governor of the city of Nairobi. And what we found was lack, lack, lack of systems. Uh, the biggest issue that we found is that Nairobi did not have A, a strategic plan, and B, a master plan. TG, Nairobi's last master plan was from 1972 to 2000. So it means from 2000 to 2013, when we got elected into office, there was no master plan. And there's no major city in the world that can run without a master plan. You need zoning, you need to know where do you put a high rise, where do you allow single family homes, where do you build a road, where do you put sewage. You need to understand where to build a market, where to have affordable housing, uh, you need to understand where to have commercial areas, you know, where your CBDs, and you need to understand also uh, where to have your entertainment and restaurants. You know, these are all functions I'm sure, of a great even city. Hospitals, uh, even, even hospitals, even hospitals and schools, uh, yeah. it, it has to be done as per plan. Yes, and I would and, want and that was a challenge. Uh, and hold that thought. I want yes. to come there. I still come back to say, yes. you walk into the office, yes. you have an entry. Yes, because Kenyans who are watching you. They, 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 they talk about what they see. Yes. They see garbage. Yes. They, you know, they see flooding. Yes. What, what, what were the giant issues in your uh, interest that, 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 that you had to grapple with? The first one was order. Lack, lack of order in the city. Uh, and we identified about 10 what we called nuisances in the city. Those illegal dumping, uh, where people who are supposed to be collecting garbage don't take the garbage to the dump site in Dandora, but just dump it anywhere, even in the middle of Uhuru Highway. Uh, we found that. Uh, we found a lot of disorder in terms of illegal structures. Uh, even in the estates, people just come up and build a kiosk, start roasting maize, uh, build uh, an eatery, start selling chapati and madondo. 
um, we found a border border menace of uh, motorbikes who zigzag and break all the traffic laws uh, in the entire city and cause a lot of accidents where they themselves get injured. Indeed, there is a ward in Kenyatta Hospital just for border border accidents. Uh, we found other nuisances like major traffic snarl up, again, because of the lack of planning. We found a nuisance of uh, zoning, where you find in areas that are not allowed for high density, there is high density housing coming up, and that puts pressure on the systems uh, in, in, in Nairobi. So we found um, lack of water. Uh, and then the biggest thing that we found, TG, and this is the first thing that we embarked upon, despite building a government, is we found out that there was no controls in the way revenue is collected. So our revenue potential was not being built. And you know, for an organization, money is like blood flowing in your, in your veins. If there's no money, you can't do anything. I think we're put, Jonathan, so, so, so yeah, that I, I think we need to yeah. discuss that. But now looking at the mountain things or the, yes. the matters that you've raised, garbage, traffic, drainage, uh, planning, order, order, and yes. all these things. Yes. Did you try, first of all, as as, as a government, uh, the governor Kidero and you as his deputy, to address that issue? And my question really is about capacity. Did you find in City Hall that patronage, uh, nepotism, had put people there maybe who are not skilled because? In order for you to deal with the problem, and we shall come to resources, we shall come to revenue. But in terms of you just walking in, uh, who, you, you, who are the soldiers? What were the boots on the ground? <laughs> that's, that's an interesting question, uh, uh, TG, because I, I learned a lesson from, from that myself as a, as a leader. Uh, first of all, remember, we are the pioneers. So we walked in and found no government. We had to build a government from scratch. Uh, we had the transitional authority to guide us uh, based on the parameters of which you build a government, but we had to hire uh, CECMs, uh, county executive committee members who are the county ministers. We had to put in a uh, public service board. We had to uh, put in uh, chief officers to, to run these are like the PSAs of the county. So the first thing before we did anything is we had to hire government. And, and I think in Governor Kidero's wisdom, he wanted some kind of continuity. So out of even the ministers that he appointed, because he was the governor, he was mandated to do so, we kept uh, maybe two or three who were officers in the county before because we did find talent in the county. Actually, I'll tell you one of the lessons I, I learned, TG, that was very humbling for me. You know, uh, I pretty educated, exposed, I have an MBA, came from the private sector, was very successful, and so did Governor Kidero. So when we came into City Hall, our outlook of City Hall was councillors throwing chairs, <laughs> uh, not going to school, uh, standard four, standard eight dropouts. Uh, but the officers we found, the engineers, the surveyors, the city planners, uh, the accountants, uh, you know, Nairobi, we found 56 CPA Kenyans. I doubt if you'll find any organization in this country that has more than five CPAKs who are working in there. We have 56 in the county. So we found a bunch of clever civil servants within the, the, the county of Nairobi. So our challenge really was just how do we use that kind of potential and capacity we found uh, to move the county forward. We also found, uh, TG, because we did an audit, out of the 15,000 employees we found there, we found that more than half of them were not qualified for their jobs. They had no capacity to do the work. They were either too old or they had zero know-how, so they didn't know how to do the job they were given to do, or they were too drunk, or they just didn't show up to work. So we had half of your workforce uh, not being productive at all. So would you agree that the, your main challenge was the human resource? Did you take a couple of months to get that sorted? Our main challenge was the revenue, because to do anything, you need money. Our second challenge, yes, was uh, capacity building. So let's talk about revenue. Yes. When you say the challenge, first of all, is it the collection of revenue? Yes. Because of unpaid rates, unpaid parking. What were the bottlenecks? What were the real thing? What was the real McCoy? Uh, the real McCoy was there was no transparent and predictable way to collect revenue. 
you went out on the streets and somebody came with a receipt and you gave them money and they gave you a receipt and you'd never know how much was collected, you'd never know how much of what was collected made it to the city coppers or it ended up in people's pockets. We found that the system that was there before didn't even know the potential of Nairobi. So for example, if you asked how many parking spaces are there in the city, nobody could tell you. If you asked how many houses does the city of Nairobi own, city council houses, nobody could tell you. If you asked somebody how many plots are there in Nairobi so that you can know what is the potential of collecting revenue on land rates, or how many businesses are there in Nairobi so you can know the potential of collecting revenue on single business permits, nobody knew. Frightfully. So, so you are basically walking <laughs> in the dark. Yes. So you are the sheriff. Uh, you've got a gun, but you don't know where to shoot. Yes, and, 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 and you know, that's why we got off to a, to a slow start. And I think, TG, the framers of the Constitution who said uh, governors should have two terms knew what they were talking about. Because we spent more than half the first term discovering stuff. Uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln said, if you give me an axe and eight hours to cut a tree, I'd spend six hours sharpening the axe. <laughs> yeah, so you had to, you had to plan. So, so we are going back to this monster called revenue. Yes. And I asked you, rates are a big part of revenue. Number one revenue source. But you can't get the rates if you don't know which properties you're charging. Correct. And so forth. Correct. So are you saying that the recording systems, the uh, IT system, whatever, was completely non-existent? There was an IT system called uh, LIFORMS, Local Authorities Information Management System, uh, but it was not integrated. So it was just a system that you would, it was like an accounting system where you'd just record the amount of revenue that comes in. And the only way that you would guarantee revenue has come in is if TG walks into the cash office and pays for something. Uh, but there was a lot of revenue that was happening out there. People used to collect rent from some of the city houses. Would you say, from out Kidero, there, that money might would you say under back. Kidero and under you, jo Jonathan, yes. you made progress there? And I, what would you tell Nairobians we, you yes. did Tremendously, to, to, to help that? Yes, actually for, for, for me, being a, having a technology background, the governor outsourced the digitization and uh, the technology roadmap for the county to me as the deputy governor. And what they did is we went and sat down with the World Bank and we hired a consultant, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and we got a technology roadmap for the county. And the first thing we did is we said we have to digitize a revenue collection system. And we advertised, we hired a company called Jumbo Pay. And when we got into office, uh, the county was collecting 7.6 billion shillings the previous year. And by the time we left, we'd gone up to 14 billion. So we doubled the amount of revenue collected so, just by putting in so a digital electronic so, so, payment so, so, so point blank, is there a working um, electronic system that can be able to track that revenue stream, whether it is house planning, rates, etc.? Did you leave that when you left? Yes, we left that. And we left uh, um, 14 billion shillings in the last year that we left. Uh, Governor Sonko was elected and he took over and he changed that system and he brought in another system. And as per the controller of budget records for the last financial year, Nairobi County collected 10 billion shillings, which was a drop in 40% from 14 billion to 10 billion. So is it working? To me, it doesn't seem like because the revenue collection has come down. But that's for the people right now at City Hall to tell. No, but talking to you as an um, IT man, yes, and talking to you for the public interest, yes, uh, do you think that there was a, a mistake to mess with the with that system? You, I, I, you, I think, you were there. I, you, I think, generally speaking, uh, as as leaders, once you take over an organisation, one key thing that we are taught in leadership is, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. We had a revenue system that our government put in that doubled the revenues in Nairobi. It was transparent, Tony. I could at any one time pick up my phone and log into the system and within that particular minute, I could know from morning until now how much money has come in and from which sources. 
and you could pay for parking. And as soon as you pay for parking, Tony, I could go on my phone and two seconds later, I could tell Tony's car, K so and so and so, has paid 300 shillings for parking. So this is so point when blank. That, when this is point blank. Yes. I'm asking you, yes. was it a mistake to change the old system, you think, with what Governor Sonko has done? I think it was a mistake because revenue has dropped by 40%. Now, because I'm not at City Hall anymore, I'm not sure if it has changed because of a management problem or because of a technology problem. But what I know, fact, and point blank, is that revenue has dropped by 40%. Now, let's then go from uh, the issue of the rates and the housing. What is the other big revenue source that the county uh, hall depends on that you help to develop Yes. to help increase revenue yes. there to, was uh, to, to feed six, your budget. six six uh, major revenue streams the county has almost 150 revenue streams and six of them uh, accounted to more than 80 percent of the revenue that came in so number one was rates number two was planning uh, planning is construction approvals i saw in the newspaper that that has decreased by more than half as well uh, number three was the business permits, uh, single business permits. Number four was parking. Number five was outdoor advertising. And number six was housing. And when you were leaving the yes. station, all of those, did you think you had improved them? And if you had, how much was the revenue that you would say you were grossing? And uh, was it enough to meet your expenses yes we had increased them we doubled them from 7.6 billion to 14 point something billion so that 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 was great uh, we it was not enough to fix our our expenses because just let me give you a financial outlook of of, of the city uh, budget is about 30 billion 18 billion goes to salaries it leaves you 12 billion out of that 12 billion about 10 or 11 billion goes to operations and maintenance. It goes to collecting your garbage, to making sure your hospitals are working, making sure your ECDs education system is working, to making sure that you have petrol in your cars, to making sure that your electricity and water bills are paid for your institutions, just generally making sure that the organization runs. So it leaves you just about one or two billion shillings to fix your infrastructure issues, your water, your roads, uh, and so on, and that is not enough. So Nairobi is underfunded. Now, in terms of the revenue you collected, you talked about people and wages. Yes. You said you found good people there. Yes. In your, uh, the, the image of City Hall from outside, yes. away from the politics, is of inefficiency, of something that doesn't work. Would you say that when you and Kidero were there, that there were men and women who were doing work was it an efficient coming from the private sector does, was it working no was no, this uh, train running on time no no it was not uh, we had a lot of room for improvement uh, there, there are quite a few opportunities that uh, in my opinion that that we missed uh, and if i was in charge of nairobi i'd have made a priority on uh, and you know point blank we could have done better so I want to ask you this at the end of the period you left. Do you think that th you had created the steps towards? Absolutely. And, and I'm asking that because has there been growth? Absolutely. In the county, in terms of capacity, in Absolutely. terms of its ability with proper leadership. So if Kenyans were elected a good governor or a good team, even if you were to run and be elected, would there, is there a better place you left it? Yes, absolutely. I think we made tremendous, tremendous progress uh, in, in education. We left after it built a few hundreds of classrooms. Uh, health, we found one health center that was 24 hours out of the 85 that we found. We left 102 health centers out of which 24 of them were 24 hours. Uh, we more than tripled maternities. Uh, we put a maternity in Kiumbwini, uh, in Kangemi, in Westlands Health Center, in Dandora Health Center, in Kwanjenga Health Center, in Dagoreti Mutwini uh, Health Center, we put uh, maternities. Uh, we put a brand new mortuary at uh, Bagathi Hospital. Uh, we increased the number of baths at Pumwani Hospital from 40 a day uh, to about 100 baths a day by the time we were leaving. Uh, we built a few 
hundreds of kilometers of, of, of roads. Um, we did quite a bit. Uh, we, we took Nairobi forward. We didn't take it to where it needs to be, but we got halfway there. Well, you are working deputy governor, or as the rumors have it here, the things are not the same now. <laughs> did, did you work well with Kidero? Yes, we did. Uh, there was a lot of mutual, mutual respect. Uh, I performed to the best of my ability what I was delegated to. Uh, but what people forget, TG, is that in, in government you can only have one leader. And that leader is the one that carries the vision. So in our case, Governor Kidero carried the vision. My job as a deputy was to help him execute his vision, which means I could only work to the extent that he enabled me to work, and I could only work on things that he, as the leader, thought were important for his vision. And that's why I said here, with a lot of respect to Governor Kidero, that he had a lot of experience and he did things in a certain way. And if I was the governor, I would have done probably things a little differently. I'd have had a little different priorities. And, and, and that's, that's normal. Well, you're watching Point Blank here at KTN News. Nairobi's uh, first county deputy governor, Jonathan Mweke, says that he would have done a better job than Evans Kidero and says Mike Sonko should not have changed a working financial system in order that revenues received now have fallen by 40%. You're watching KTN News.